Introductory Note to Poems of Emil Faharen, Selected and Rendered into English by Alma Strettel. Emil Faharen, remarkable among the brilliant group of writers representing young Belgium, and one who has been recognised by the literary world as holding a foremost place among the lyric poets of the day, was born at Saint Amand, near Antwerp, in 1855. His childhood was passed on the banks of the Schelt, in the midst of the wide-spreading Flemish plains, a country of mist and flood, of dikes and marshes, and the impressions he received from the mysterious melancholy character of those surroundings have produced a marked and lasting influence upon his work. Yet the other characteristics with which it is stamped, the wealth of imagination, the wonderful descriptive power and sense of colour which sets the landscape before one as a picture, suggest rather the possibility of Spanish blood in the poet's veins. Faharen entered early in life upon the literary career. After some time spent at a college in Ghent, he became a student at the University of Louvain, and here he founded and edited a journal called La Semaine, in which work he was assisted by the singer Van Dyck and by his friend, the publisher, Edmond de Mont. He also formed about this time a close friendship with Matterlink. In 1881, Faharen was called to the bar at Brussels, but soon gave up his legal career to devote himself entirely to literature. In 1883, he published his first volume of poems, and shortly afterwards became one of the editors of La Moderne, to which, as well as to other contemporary periodicals, he was for many years a contributor. In 1892, he founded, with the help of two other friends, the Section of Art in the House of the People, a popular institution in Brussels, where performances of the best music, as well as lectures upon literary and artistic subjects, were given. In spite, however, of the work which all this entailed, and of the many interests created by his ardent appreciation of the various branches of art and literature, Faharen continued to labour unceasingly at his poetical work. He has now for many years ceased to live in Brussels, and spends his winters in Paris, and his summers at his country house in Belgium, which bears the quaint name of Caillou Quibic, and lies near the French frontier by Maubeuge. Between the year 1883 and the present time, he has brought out the following volumes, Les Flamandes, Les Moines, Les Soirs, Les Débâcles, Les Flambeaux Noirs, Les Apparus dans mes chemins, Les Campagnes Hallucinées, Les Villages Illusoires, Les Vies Tentaculaires, Les Heures Claires, Les Visages de la Vie, Les Forces Tumultueuses, and La Multiple Splendeur. To these must be added four dramatic pieces, Les Aubes, Philippe de, Hélène de Sparte, and Le Cloître. This, the finest of the dramas, was written fifteen years ago, but we have only recently had the privilege of seeing it on the London stage. Throughout this entire series, the intellectual and spiritual development of the poet may be traced, from the more materialistic tone which marks his earliest work, and the pessimistic emotional strain, the throes of a soul in revolt against fate, which are so powerfully portrayed in Les Débâcles and Les Flambeaux Noirs, to the tender, serene mysticism which characterises the later poems of Les Apparus dans mes chemins, and the wonderful sympathy with nature, even in her saddest aspects, the subtle power of endowing those aspects with a profound and ennobling symbolism which distinguish the beautiful poems named Les Villages Illusoires. Les Heures Claires is the title of a volume of love songs, an exquisite record of golden hours spent in a garden at springtime. In his later volumes, and specially in La Multiple Splendeur, Faharen yet further unfolds the spiritual ideas which he has drawn from his contemplation of nature, of her beauties and all that she symbolises, and of the human element so ardently working out its development upon her field. I learnt to know, he says, that beauty in all its expressions was what awoke in me the loftiest ideas, 
and that the supreme beauty was to be found in man. And so I feel that my earlier nature poems are destined, as it were, for a background on which to paint my higher vision, the progress of man towards the ideal life. In style, Faharan is the apostle of the ver libre, and his handling of rhyme and rhythm, his coining of words where he finds the French vocabulary inadequate, are both daring and suggestive. He has undeniably forged a rare and powerful weapon of poetic eloquence, and shows a wealth of imagery, a depth of thought, and a subtlety of expression, which could not have been imprisoned behind the bars of a rigid convention. English readers have been much accustomed by their own poets to the ver libre, and it is not so much, therefore, for my adherence to this form, as for my failure to adequately render Faharan's peculiar and striking beauty of language, that I beg their indulgence for the following translations. To make a typical selection from a poet's work is always difficult. In this small volume, first published some years ago, the field of selection had been limited to the three volumes of what may be called Faharan's middle period, and we are now able to add only three of the later poems, as a new edition seems called for immediately. At this moment, when the interest and sympathy of the whole world are centred upon the tragic sufferings of Belgium, the vividness of the pictures here presented of the silent Flemish plains, the pitiless rain, the long dikes wrapped in mist, the lonely windswept villages, the blazing belfry, must indeed come home to us all with poignant force, for not only are they a fitting background for the Belgian people's unutterable woe, but they are also the surroundings among which our own men are in the throes of their life and death struggle. The symbolic meanings which the poet attaches to many of these pictures will be felt with no less force. The first impression is one of sad endurance, but I am glad to remember that in the later pages of this volume the sun breaks through, and that glorious St. George, with his special message to English hearts, brings a note of good cheer to all militant spirits. London, January 1915 End of introductory note From Les Villages Illusoires Rain Long as unending threads the long-drawn rain, interminably, with its nails of grey, athwart the dull grey day, rakes the green window-pane, so infinitely, endlessly, the rain, the long, long rain, the rain. Since yesternight it keeps unravelling, down from the frayed and flaccid rags that cling about the sullen sky, the low black sky. Since yesternight, so slowly, patiently, unravelling its threads upon the roads, upon the roads and lanes, with even fall, continual. Along the miles that twixt the meadows and the suburbs lie, by roads interminably bent, the files of wagons with their awnings arched and tall, struggling in sweat and steam, toil slowly by with outline vague as of a funeral into the ruts unbroken, regular, stretching out parallel so far that when night comes they seem to join the sky, for hours the water drips, and every tree and every dwelling weeps, drenched as they are with it, with the long rain, tenaciously, with rain, indefinite. The rivers through each rotten dyke that yields discharge their swollen wave upon the fields, where coils of drowned hay float far away, and the wild breeze buffets the alders and the walnut trees. Knee-deep in water, great black oxen stand, lifting their bellowings sinister on high to the distorted sky, as now the night creeps onward, all the land, thicket and plain, grows cumbered with her clinging shades immense. And still there is the rain, the long, long rain, like soot so fine and dense. The long, long rain, rain, and its threads identical, and its nails systematical, weaving the garment, making
mesh by mesh amain, of destitution for each house and wall, and fences that enfold the villages, neglected, grey and old, chaplets of rags and linen shreds that fall in frayed-out wisps from upright poles and tall, blue pigeon-houses glued against the thatch, and windows with a patch of dingy paper on each lowering pane, houses with straight-set gutters, side by side across the broad stone gables crucified, mills uniform forlorn, each rising from its hillock like a horn, steeples afar, and chapels round about, the rain, the long, long rain, through all the winter wears and wears them out, rain with its many wrinkles, the long rain with its grey nails, and with its watery mane, the long rain of these lands of long ago, the rain eternal in its torpid flow. End of part one. The Ferryman The Ferryman, a green reed twixt his teeth, with hand on oar against the currents strong, had rowed and rowed so long. But she, alas, whose voice was hailing him across the far waves dim, still further o'er the far waves seemed to float, still further backward mid the mists remote. The casements with their eyes, the dial faces of the towers that rise upon the shore, watched as he strove and laboured more and more with frantic bending of the back in two and start of savage muscles strained anew. One oar was suddenly riven, and by the current driven, with lash of heavy breakers out to sea, but she whose voice that hailed him he could hear, there mid the mist and wind, she seemed to wring her hands with gestures yet more maddening, toward him who drew not near. The ferryman, with his surviving oar, fell harder yet to work, and more and more he strove, till every joint did crack and start, and fevered terror shook his very heart. The rudder broke beneath one sharp rude stroke, that too the currents drove relentlessly, a dreary shred of wreckage out to sea. The casements by the pier, like eyes immense and feverish open wide, the dials of the towers, those windows drear, upstanding straight from mile to mile beside the banks of rivers, obstinately gaze upon this madman, in his headstrong craze prolonging his mad voyage gainst the tide. But she, who yonder in the mist clouds hailed him still so desperately, she wailed and wailed, with head outstretched in fearful straining haste, toward the unknown of the outstretched waste. Steady as one that had in bronze been cast, amid the blenched grey tempest and the blast, the ferryman his single oar yet plied, and, spite of all, still lashed and bit the tide. His old eyes, with hallucinated gaze, saw that far distance, an illumined haze, whence the voice sounded, coming toward him still, beneath the cold skies, lamentable, shrill. The last oar broke, and this the current hurried at one stroke, like a frail straw toward the distant sea. The ferryman, with arms dropped helplessly, sank on his bench forlorn, his loins with vain efforts broken, torn. Drifting, his bark struck somewhere, as by chance he turned a glance toward the bank behind him then, and saw he had not left the shore. The casements and the dials, one by one, their huge eyes gazing in a foolish stare, witnessed the ruin of his ardour there, but still the old tenacious ferryman, firm in his teeth, for God knows when, indeed, held the green reed. End of part two The Silence Ever since ending of the summer weather, when last the thunder and the lightning broke, shattering themselves upon it at one stroke, the silence has not stirred there in the heather. 
all round about stand steeples straight as stakes and each its bell between its fingers shakes all round about with their three-storied loads the teams prowl down the roads all round about where'er the pine woods end the wheel creaks on along its rutty bed but not a sound is strong enough to rend that space intense and dead since summer thunder laden last was heard the silence has not stirred and the broad heathland where the nights sink down beyond the sandhills brown beyond the endless thickets closely set to the far borders of the far away prolongs it yet even the winds disturb not as they go the boughs of those long larches bending low where the marsh water lies in which its vacant eyes gaze at themselves unceasing stubbornly only sometimes as on their way they move the noiseless shadows of the clouds above or of some great birds hovering flight on high brush it in passing by since the last bolt that scored the earth aslant nothing has pierced the silence dominant of those who cross its vast immensity whether at twilight or at dawn it be there is not one but feels the dread of the unknown that it instils an ample force supreme it holds its sway uninterruptedly the same for i dark walls of blackest fir trees bar from sight the outlook towards the paths of hope and light huge pensive junipers affright from far the passing travellers long narrow paths stretch their straight lines unbent till they fork off in curves malevolent and the sun ever shifting ceaseless lends fresh aspects to the mirage with a tense bewilderment since the last bolt was forged amid the storm the polar silence at the corners four of the wide heatherland has stirred no more old shepherds whom their hundred years have worn to things all dislocate and out of gear and their old dogs ragged tired out and torn oft watch it on the soundless lowlands near or downs of gold beflecked with shadows flight sit down immensely there beside the night then at the curves and corners of the mere the waters creep with fear the heather veils itself grows wan and white all the leaves listen upon all the bushes and the incendiary sunset hushes before its face his cries of brandished light and in the hamlets that about it lie beneath the thatches of their hovels small the terror dwells of feeling it is nigh and though it stirs not dominating all broken with dull despair and helplessness beneath its presence they crouch motionless as though upon the watch and dread to see through rifts of vapour open suddenly at evening in the moon the argent eyes of its mute mysteries End of part three The Bell Ringer Yon in the depths of the evening's track, like a herd of blind bullocks that seek their fellows, wild as in terror the tempest bellows. And suddenly there o'er the gables black that the church in the twilight around it raises, all scored with lightnings the steeple blazes. See the old bell ringer frenzied with fear mouth gaping yet speechless draw hastening near and the knell of alarm that with strokes of lead he rings heaves forth in a tempest of dread the frantic despair that throbs in his head with the cross at the height of its summit brandished the lofty steeple spreads the crimson mane of the fire o'er the plain toward the dreamlike horizons that bound the night the city nocturnal is filled with light the face of the swift gathered crowds doth people with fears and with clamours both street and lane on walls turn suddenly dazzling bright the dusky panes drink the crimson flood like draughts of blood yet knell upon knell 
The old ringer doth cast his frenzy and fear o'er the country vast. The steeple, it seems to be growing higher, against the horizon that shifts and quivers, and to be flying in gleams of fire, far o'er the lakes and the swampy rivers, its slates like wings of sparks and spangles, afar it flings. They fly toward the forests across the night, and in their passage the fires exhume the hovels and huts from their folds of gloom, setting them suddenly all alight. In the crashing fall of the steeple's crown, the cross to the brazier's depth drops down, where, twisted and torn in the fiery fray, its Christian arms are crushed like prey. With might and main, the bell-ringer sounds his knell abroad, as though the flames would burn his god. The fire, funnel-like, hollows its way yet higher, twixt walls of stone, up the steeple's height, gaining the archway and lofty stage, where swinging in light, the bell bounds with rage. The doors and the owls, with wild long cry, pass screeching by. On the fast-closed casements their heads they smite, burn in the smoke-drifts their pinions light. Then, broken with terror and bruised with flight, suddenly mid the surging crowd fall dead outright. The old man sees toward his brandish bells the climbing fire with hands of boiling gold stretch nigher. The steeple looks like a thicket of crimson bushes, with here a branch of flame that rushes, darting the belfry boards between. Convulsed with savage flames they cling, with curves that plants like curl and lean, round every joist, round every pulley, and monumental beams whence ring the bells that voice forth frenzied folly. His fear and anguish spent, the ringer sounds his own knell on his ruined bell. A final crash, all dust and plaster, in one grey flash, cleaves the whole steeple's height in pieces, and like some great cry slain, it ceases all in an instant, the knell's dull rage. The ancient tower seems sudden to lean and darkly lower, while with heavy thuds, as from stage to stage, they headlong bound, the bells are heard, plunging and crashing toward the ground. But yet, the old ringer has never stirred, and scooping the moist earth out, the bell was thus his coffin and grave as well. End of part four The Snow Uninterruptedly falls the snow, like meagre long wool strands, scant and slow, o'er the meagre long plain, disconsolate, cold with lovelessness, warm with hate. Infinite, infinite falls the snow, like a moment's time, monotonously, in a moment's time, on the houses it falls and drops the snow, Monotonous, whitening them o'er with rhyme, it falls on the sheds and their palings below, and myriad wise it falls and lies in rigid waves, in the churchyard hollows between the graves. The apron of all inclement weather is roughly unfastened there on high, the apron of woes and misery is shaken by wind gusts violently down on the hamlets that crouch together beneath the dull horizon's sky. The frost creeps down to the very bones, and want creeps in through the walls and stones. Yea, snow and want round the souls creep close, the heavy snow diaphanous, round the stone-cold hearths and the flameless souls that wither away in their huts and holes. The hamlets bare, white, white as death lie yonder, where the crooked roadways cross and halt. Like branching traceries of salt, the trees, all crystallised with frost, stretch forth their boughs, entwined and crossed, 
along the ways as on they go in far procession o'er the snow then here and there some ancient mill where light pale mosses aggregate appears on a sudden standing straight like a snare upon its lonely hill the roofs and sheds down there below since november dawned have been wrestling still in contrary blasts with the hurricane while thick and full yet falls amain the infinite snow with its weary weight o'er the meagre long plain disconsolate thus journeys the snow afar so fleet into every cranny on every trail always the snow and its winding sheets the mortuary snow so pale the snow unfruitful and so pale in wild and vagabond tatters hurled through the limitless winter of the world end of part five the grave digger in the garden yonder of yews and death there sojourneth a man who toils and has toiled for aye digging the dried up ground all day some willows surviving their own dead selves weep there around him as he delves and a few poor flowers disconsolate because the tempest and wind and wet vex them with ceaseless scourge and fret the ground is nothing but pits and cones deep graves in every corner yawn the frost in the winter cracks the stones and when the summer in june is born one hears mid the silence that pants for breath the germinating and life of death below among the lifeless bones since ages longer than he can know the grave-digger brings his human woe that never wears out and lays its head slowly down in that earthly bed by all the surrounding roads each day they come toward him the coffins white they come in processions infinite they come from the distances far away from corners obscure and out of the way from the heart of the towns and the wide-spreading plain the limitless plain swallows up their track they come with their escort of people in black at every hour till the day doth wane and at early dawn the long trains forlorn begin again the grave digger hears far off the knell beneath weary skies of the passing bell since ages longer than he can tell some grief of his each coffin carrieth his wild desires toward evenings dark with death are here his mournings for he knows not what here are his tears for ever on this spot motionless in their shrouds his memories with gaze worn out from travelling through the years so far to bid him call to mind the fears of which their souls are dying and with these lies side by side the shattered body of his broken pride his heroism to which naught replied is here all unavailing his courage neath its heavy armour failing and his poor valour gashed upon the brow silent and crumbling in corruption now the grave-digger watches them come into sight the long slow roads marching toward him with all their loads of coffins white here are his keenest thoughts that one by one his lukewarm soul hath tainted and undone and his white loves of simple days of yore in lewd and tempting mirrors solid awe the proud mute vows that to himself he made are here for he hath scored and cancelled them as one may cut and notch a diadem and here inert and prone his will is laid whose gestures flashed like lightning keen before but that he now can raise in strength no more the grave digger digs to the sound of the knell mid the ewes and the deaths in yonder dell since ages longer than he can tell here is his dream born in the radiant glow of joy and young oblivion long ago that in black fields of science he let go that he hath clothed with flame and embers bright red wings plucked off from folly in her flight 
that he hath launched toward inaccessible spaces afar, toward the distance there, the golden conquest of the impossible, and that the limitless, refractory sky sends back to him again, or it has e'er so much as touched the immobile mystery. The gravedigger turneth it round and round, with arms by toil so weary made, with arms so thin and strokes of spade, since what long times the dried-up ground. Here for his anguish and remorse their throng pardons denied to creatures in the wrong, and here the tears, the prayers, the silent cries he would not list to in his brother's eyes, the insults to the gentle, and the jeer what time the humble bent to their knees are here, gloomy denials and a bitter store of arid sarcasms oft poured out before devotedness that in the shadow stands with outstretched hands. The grave digger, weary, yet eager as well, hiding his pain to the sound of the knell, with strokes of the spade, turns round and round the weary sods of the dried-up ground. Then, fear-struck dallyings with suicide, delays that conquer hours that would decide, again, the terrors of dark crime and sin furtively felt with frenzied fingers thin, the fierce craze and the fervent rage, to be the man who lives of the extremity of his own fear, and then too, doubt immense and wilder fright, and madness with its eyes of marble white, these all are here. His head a prey to the dull knell's sound, in terror the gravedigger turns the ground with strokes of the spade, and doth ceaseless cast the dried-up earth upon his past. The slain days and the present he doth see, quelling each quivering thrill of life to be, and drop by drop, through fists whose fingers start, pressing the future blood of his red heart, chewing with teeth that grind and crush each part of that his future's body, limb by limb, till there is but a carcass left to him, and showing him, in coffins prisoned, or ever they be born, his longings dead. The grave-digger yonder doth hear the knell, more heavy yet of the passing bell, that up through the morning horizons doth swell, what if the bells with their haunting swing would stop on a day that heart-breaking ring, and the endless procession of course after course choke the highways no more of his long remorse, but the beers with the prayers and the tears immensely yet follow the beers, they halt by crucifix now and by shrine, then take up once more their mournful line, on the backs of men, upon trestles borne, they follow their uniform march forlorn, skirting each field and each garden wall, passing beneath the signpost tall, skirting along by the vast unknown, where terror points horns from the cornerstone. The old man, broken and propless quite, watches them still from the infinite, coming toward him, and hath beside nothing to do but in earth to hide his multiple death, thus, bit by bit, and with fingers irresolute, plant on it crosses so hastily, day by day, since what long times he cannot say. End of part six The Wind Crossing the infinite length of the moorland, here comes the wind, the wind with his trumpets that heralds November, endless and infinite crossing the downs. Here comes the wind that teareth himself, and doth fiercely dismember, with heavy breaths turbulent smiting the towns. The savage wind comes, the fierce wind of November. Each bucket of iron at the wells of the farmyards, each bucket and pulley, it creaks and it wails, by cisterns of farmyards, the pulleys and pails, they creak and they cry, the whole of sad death in their melancholy. The wind, it sends scudding dead leaves from the birches, 
along o'er the water, the wind of November, the savage, fierce wind, the boughs of the trees for the birds' nests it searches, to bite them and grind, the wind as though rasping down iron grates past, and furious and fast, from afar combs the cold and white avalanches of winter the old, the savage wind combs them so furious and fast, the wind of November. From each miserable shed, the patched garret windows wave wild overhead, their foolish poor tatters of paper and glass, as the savage fierce wind of November doth pass, and there on its hill of dingy and dun-coloured turf, the black mill, swift up from below, through the empty air slashing, swift down from above, like a lightning stroke flashing, the black mill, so sinister moweth the wind, the savage fierce wind of November. The old ragged thatches that squat round their steeple are raised on their roof poles and fall with a clap, in the wind the old thatches and penthouses flap, in the wind of November, so savage and hard, the crosses, and they are the arms of dead people, the crosses that stand in the narrow churchyard, fall prone on the sod, like some great flight of black in the acre of God. The wind of November, have you met him, the savage wind, do you remember, did he pass you so fleet, where, yon at the cross, the three hundred roads meet, with distressful panting and wailing with cold, yea, he who breeds fears and puts all things to flight, did you see him that night, when the moon he o'erthrew, when the villagers, old in their rot and decay, past endurance and spent, cried wailing like beasts, neath the hurricane bent. Here comes the wind howling, that heralds dark weather, the wind blowing infinite over the heather, the wind with his trumpets that heralds November. End of part seven. The Fisherman The spot is flaked with mist, that fills, thickening into rolls more dank, the thresholds and the window sills, and smokes on every bank. The river stagnates, pestilence with carrion by the current sent, this way and that, and yonder lies the moon, just like a woman dead, that they have smothered overhead, deep in the skies. In a few boats alone there gleam lamps that light up and magnify the backs, bent over stubbornly of the old fishers of the stream, who since last evening steadily, for God knows what night fishery, have let their black nets downward slow into the silent water go, the noisome water there below. Down in the river's deeps, ill fate and black mischances breed and hatch, unseen of them, and lie in wait as for their prey, and these they catch with weary toil, believing still that simple honest work is best, at night beneath the shifting mist, unkind and chill. So hard and harsh, yon clock towers tell, with muffled hammers like a knell, the midnight hour, from tower to tower, so hard and harsh the midnight's chime, the midnight's harsh of autumn time, the weary midnight spell. The crew of fishers black have on their back naught save a nameless rag or two, and their old hats distill with all, and drop by drop let crumbling fall into their necks the mist flakes all. The hamlets and their wretched huts are numb and drowsy, and all round the willows too, and walnut trees, gainst which the easterly fierce breeze has waged its feud, no bayings from the forest sound, no cry the empty midnight cuts, the midnight space that grows imbrued with damp breaths from the ashy ground. The fishers hail each other not, nor help in their fraternal lot, doing but that which must be done, each fishes for himself alone. 
and this one gathers in his net, drawing it tighter yet, his freight of petty misery, and that one drags up recklessly diseases from their slimy bed, while others still their meshes spread out to the sorrows that drift by, threateningly nigh, and the last hauls aboard with force the wreckage dark of his remorse. The river round its corners bending, and with the dyke heads intertwined, goes hence, since what time's out of mind, toward the far horizon wending, of weariness unending, upon the banks the skins of wet black ooze heaps, nightly poison sweat, and the mists are their fleeces light, that curl up to the house's height. In their dark boats where nothing stirs, not even the red flame torch that blurs with halos huge, as if of blood, the thick felt of the mist's white hud, death with his silence seals the seer old fisherman of madness here. The isolated, they abide deep in the mist, still side by side, but seeing one another never, weary are both their arms, and yet their work their ruin doth beget. Each for himself works desperately, he knows not why, no dreams has he, long have they worked, for long, long years, while every instant brings its fears, nor have they ever quitted the borders of their river, where mid the moonlit mists they strain to fish misfortune up a main. If but in this their night they hailed each other, and brothers' voices might console a brother. But numb and sullen, on they go, with heavy brows and backs bent low, while their small lights beside them gleam, flickering feebly on the stream. Like blocks of shadow they are there, nor ever do their eyes divine that far away beyond the mists, acrid and spongy, there exists a firmament where, mid the night, attractive as a lodestone, bright, prodigious planet shine. The fissures black of that black plague, they are the lost immeasurably, among the knells the distance vague, the yonder of those endless plains that stretch more far than I can see, and the damp autumn midnight reigns into their soul's monotony. End of part eight. The Rope Maker In his village grey, at foot of the dikes that encompass him with weary weaving of curves and lines, toward the sea outstretching dim, the rope-maker, visionary white, stepping backwards along the way, prudently twixt his hands combines the distant threads in their twisting play that come to him from the infinite. When day is gone, through ardent weary evenings, yon the whir of a wheel can yet be heard, something by unseen hands is stirred, and parallel o'er the rakes that trace an even space from point to point along all the way, the flaxen hemp still plaits its chain, ceaseless for days and weeks amain. With his poor tired fingers, nimble still, fearing to break for want of skill, the fragments of gold that the gliding light threads through his toil so scantily, passing the walls and the houses by, the rope-maker, visionary white, from depths of the evening's whirlpool dim, draws the horizons into him. Horizons that stretch back afar, where strife, regrets, hates, furies are, tears of the silence and the tears that find a voice, serenest years, or years convulsed with pang and throe, horizons of the long ago, these gestures of the past they show, of old, as one in sleep, life errant, strayed its wondrous morns and fabled evenings through, when God's right hand toward far Canaan's blue traced golden paths deep in the twilight shade. Of old was life exasperate, huge and tense, swung savage at some stallion's mane, 
life fleet, with mighty lightnings flashing neath her feet, upreared immensely over space immense. Of old, twas life evoking ardent will, and hell's red cross and heaven's cross of white each marched, with gleam of steely armour's light, through streams of blood to heavens of victory still. Of old, life, livid, foaming, came and went mid strokes of toxin and assassin's knife, prescribers, murderers, each with each at strife, while mad and splendid, death above them bent. Twixt fields of flax and of osiers red, on the road where nothing doth move or tread, by houses and walls to left and right, the rope-maker, visionary white, from depths of evening's treasury dim, draws the horizons into him. Horizons that stretch yonder far, where work, strifes, ardours, science are, horizons that change, they pass and glide, and on their way they show in mirrors of eventide the morning image of dark to-day. Here, writhing fires that never rest nor end, where, in one giant effort all employed, Sages cast down the gods to change the void, whither the flights of human science tend. Here tis a room where thought, assertive, saith that there are weights exact to gauge her by, that inane ether only rounds the sky, and that in files of glass men breed up death. Here tis a workshop where all fiery bright, Matter intense vibrates with fierce turmoil In vaults where wonders new, mid stress and toil, Are forged that can absorb space, time and night. At palace of an architecture grown effete, And weary neath its hundred years, Whence voices vast invoke, instinct with fears, The thunder in its flights toward the unknown, on the silent even road, his eyes still fixed toward the waning light that skirts the houses and walls as it dies, the rope-maker, visionary white, from depths of the evening's halo dim, draws the horizons into him. Horizons that are there afar, where light, hope, wakenings, strivings are, horizons that he sees defined as hope for some future, far and kind, beyond those distant shores and faint, that evening on the clouds doth paint. Yon, mid that distance, calm and musical, twin stairs of gold suspend their steps of blue, the sage doth climb them, and the seer too, starting from sides opposed, toward one goal. Yon, contradictions, lightning shocks, lose power, Doubt sullen hand unclenches to the light, The eye sees in their essence laws unite, Rays scattered once mid doctrines of an hour. Yon keenest spirits pierce beyond the land Of seeming and of death, the heart hath ease, And one would say that mildness held the keys Of the colossal silence in her hand. Up yon the god each soul is, once again creates, expands, gives, finds himself in all, and rises higher, the lowlier he doth fall, before meek tenderness and sacred pain. And there is ardent living peace, its urns of even bliss, ranged mid these twilights, where, embers of hope upon the ashen air, each great nocturnal planet steadfast burns. In his village, at foot of the dikes that bend, Sinuous weary about him and wend Toward that distance of eddying light, The rope-maker, visionary white, Along by each house and each garden wall, Absorbs in himself the horizons all. End of part nine From Les Eurs Claire. 1. 
O splendour of our joy and our delight, Woven of gold amid the silken air, See the dear house among its gables light, And the green garden and the orchard there. Here is the bench with apple trees o'erhead, Whence the light spring is shed, With touch of petals falling slow and soft. Here branches luminous take flight aloft, Hovering like some bounteous presage, High against this landscape's clear and tender sky. Here lie, like kisses from the lips dropped down Of yon frail azure upon earth below, Two simple, pure, blue pools, And like a crown about their edge, Chance flowers artless grow. O splendour of our joy and of ourselves, Whose life doth feed within this garden bright, Upon the emblems of our own delight. What are those forms that yonder slowly pass? Our two glad souls are they, That pastime take and stray Along the terraces and woodland grass. Are these thy breasts? Are these thine eyes? These two golden bright flowers of harmonious hue, These grasses, hanging like some plumage rare, Bathed in the stream they ruffle by their touch, are they the strands of thy smooth, glossy hair? No shelter e'er could match yon orchard white, Or yonder house amid its gables light, And garden that so blessed the sky controls, Weaving the climate dear to both our souls. 8. As in the guileless golden age, My heart I gave thee, even like an ample flower that opens in the dew's bright morning hour, my lips have rested where the frail leaves part. I plucked the flower, it came from meadows whereon grow the flowers of flame. Speak to it not, tis best that we control words, since they needs are trivial twixt us two. All words are hazardous, for it is through the eyes that soul doth hearken unto soul. That flower that is my heart, and where secure my heart's avowal hides, simply confides unto thy lips that she is clear and pure, loyal and good, and that one's trust toward a virgin love is like a child's in God. Let wit and wisdom flower upon the height, along capricious paths of vanity, and give we welcome to sincerity that holds between her fingers crystal bright our two clear hearts. For what so beautiful as a confession made from soul to soul when Eve returns, and the white flame of countless diamonds burns, like myriads of silent eyes intent, the unfathomed silence of the firmament? 17 that we may love each other through our eyes. Let us our glances lave, and make them clear of all the thousand glances that they here have met in this base world of servile lies. The dawn is dressed in blossom and in dew, and chequered too with very tender light. It looks as though frail plumes of sun and silver through the mist glided across the garden to and fro, and with a soft caress the mosses kissed. Our wondrous ponds of blue tremble and wake with golden shimmerings, swift emerald flights beneath the trees dart through, and now the light from hedge and path anew sweeps the damp dust where yet the twilight clings. 21. In hours like these, when through our dream of bliss so far from all things not ourselves we move, what lustral blood, what baptism is this that bathes our hearts, straining toward perfect love? Our hands are clasped, and yet there is no prayer, our arms outstretched, and yet no cry is there. Adoring something, what, we cannot say, more pure than we are, and more far away, with spirits fervent and most guileless grown, how we are mingled and dissolved in one. Ah, how we live each other in the unknown! Oh, 
how absorbed and wholly lost before the presence of those hours supreme one lies and how the soul would fain find other skies to seek therein new gods it might adore o oh, marvellous and agonising joy audacious hope whereon the spirit hangs of being one day once more the prey beyond even death of these deep silent pangs End of part 10 From Les Apparus dans mes chemins St. George Opening the mists on a sudden through An avenue, then all one ferment of varied gold With foam of plumes where the chamfron bends Round his horse's head that no bits doth hold St. George descends the diamond-rayed caparison makes of his flight one declining path from heaven's pity down upon our waiting earth hero and lord of the joyous helpful virtues all sonorous pure and crystalline let his radiance fall on my heart nocturnal and make it shine in the wheeling aureole of his sword let the wind's soft sylvan whispers sound and ring his coat of mail around his battle spurs amid the fight he the saint george who shines so bright and comes mid the wailings of my desire to seize and lift my poor hands higher toward his dauntless valour's fire like a cry great with faith to god his lance saint george upraised doth hold crossing athwart my glance he trod as twere one tumult of haggard gold the chrism's glow on his forehead shone the great saint george of duty high beautiful by his heart and by himself alone ring all my voices of hope ring on ring forth in me beneath fresh boughs of greenery down radiant pathways full of sun ye glints of silvery mica be bright joy amid my stones and ye white pebbles that the waters strew open your eyes in my brooklets through the watery lids that cover you landscape of gushing springs and sun with gold that quivers on misty blue landscape that dwells in me hold thou the mirror now to the fiery flights that flaming roll of the great saint george toward my soul Against the black dragon's teeth and claws, Against the armour of leprous sores, The miracle and sword is he, On his breastplate burneth charity, And his gentleness sends hurtling back, In dire defeat, the instinct black. Fires flecked with gold that flashing turn, Whirlwinds of stars those glories meet, About his galloping horse's feet, deep into my remembrance burn their lightnings fleet he comes a fair ambassador from white lands built with marble ore where grows in glades beside the sea upon the tree of goodness fragrant gentleness that haven too he knows no less where wondrous ships rock calm and still that freights of sleeping angels fill and those vast evenings when below upon the water mid the sky's reflected eyes islands flash sudden forth and glow that kingdom fair whereof the virgin ariseth queen it slowly ardent joy is he and his flaming sword in the ambient air vibrates like an ostensory the suddenly flashing saint george behold he strikes through my soul like a fire of gold he knows from what far wanderings i come what mists obscure my brain what dagger marks have deeply scarred my thought and with black crosses marred with what spent force what anger vain what petty scorn of better things yea and with what a mask i came folly upon the lees of shame a coward was i the world i fled to hide my head within a huge and futile me i builded beneath domes of night the blocks of marble gold bestarred 
of a hostile science, endlessly toward a height by oracles of blackness barred. For death alone is queen of night, and human effort is brightest born only at dawn, with opening flowers would prayer fain bloom, and their sweet lips hold the same perfume. The sunbeams shimmering white that fall on pearly water are for all like a caress upon our life. The dawn unfolds a counsel fair of trustfulness, and whoso hearkens thereto is saved from his slough where never a sin was laved. St. George in radiant armour came speeding along in leaps of flame mid the sweet morning through my soul. Young, beautiful by faith was he, he leaned the lower down toward me, even as I the lowlier knelt, like some pure golden cordial in secret felt, he filled me with his soaring strength, and with sweet fear most tenderly, before that vision's dignity, into his pale proud hand at length I cast the blood my pain had spent, then, laying upon me as he went a charge of valour, and the sign of the cross on my brow from his lance divine, he sped upon his shining road, straight with my heart toward his God. End of part 11 The Gardens The landscape now reveals a change, a stare that twined elm boughs hold enclosed mid hedges mystic strange, inaugurates a green and gold vision of gardens range on range each steps a hope that doth ascend stairwise to expectation's height a weary way it is to wend while noonday suns are burning bright but rest waits at the evening's end streams that wash white from sin flow deep and round about the fresh lawns twine while there beneath the green bank steep Beside his cross, the Lamb Divine lies tranquilly in peaceful sleep. The daisied grass is glad, and gay with crystal butterflies the hedge, where globes of fruit shine blue. Here stray peacocks beside the box-tree's edge, a shining lion bars the way. Flowers, upright as the ecstasies, and ardours of white spirits pure, with branches springing fountain-wise, burst upward, and by impulse sure to their own soaring splendour rise. Gently and very slowly swayed, the wind a wordless rhapsody sings, and the shimmering air doth braid an aureole of filigree round every disc with emerald laid. Even the shade is but a flight toward flickering radiances that slip from space to space and now the light sleeps with calmed rays upon the lip of lilac blossoms golden white. End of part 12 She of the Garden In such a spot, with radiant flowers for halo, I saw the guardian angel sit her down. Vine branches fashioned a green shrine above her, and sunflowers rose behind her like a crown. Her fingers, their white slenderness encircled, with humble, fragile rings of coral round, held, ranged in couples, sprays of faithful roses, sealed with a clasp, with threads of woollen bound. A shimmering air the golden calm was weaving, all filigreed with dawn, that like a braid surmounted her pure brow, which still was hidden, half in the shade. Woven of linen were her veil and sandals, but, twined mid boughs of foliage, on their hem the theologic virtues three were painted, hearts set about with gold encompassed them. Her silken hair, slow rippling from her shoulder down to the mosses of the sward did reach, the childhood of her eyes disclosed a silence more sweet than speech. My arms outstretched and all my soul upstraining, then did I rise with haggard yearning toward the soul suspended there in her eyes. Those eyes, they shone so vivid with remembrance, 
that they confess days lived alike with me. Oh, in the grave in violet can it change then, the long ago, and live in the to be. Sure, she was one who, being dead, yet brought me, miraculous, a strength that comforteth, and the viaticum of her survival, guiding me from the further side of death. End of part 13 From La Multiple Splendeur The Glory of the Heavens Shining in dim transparency, the whole of infinity lies behind the veils that the finger of radiant winter weaves, and down on us falls the foliage of stars in glittering sheaves. From out the depths of the forest, the forest obscure of the skies. The winged sea with her shadowy floods, as of dappled silk, speeds neath the golden fires, her pale immensity o'er, and diamond rayed, the moonlight, shining along the shore, bathes the brow of the headlands in radiance as soft as milk. Yonder their flow, untwining and twining their loops anew, the mighty silvery rivers through the translucent night, and a glint as of wondrous acids sparkles with a magic light in the cup that the lake outstretches toward the mountains blue. Everywhere light seems breaking forth into flower and star, whether on shore in stillness or wavering on the deep. The islands are nests where silence inviolates doth sleep, an ardent nimbus hovers o'er yon horizons far. See, from Nadir to Zenith, one aureole doth reach. Of yore the souls exalted by faith's high mysteries saw in the domination of those star-clouded skies Jehovah's hand resplendent, and heard his silent speech. But now the eyes that scan them no longer may there aspire to see some god self-banished, not so, but the intricate tangle of marvellous problems, the messengers that wait on measureless force and veil her there on her couch of fire. O cauldrons of life, where matter, adown the eternal day, pours herself fruitful, seething through paths of scattering flame, O flux of worlds and reflux to other worlds the same, unending oscillation betwixt never and for aye, Tumults consumed in whirlpools of speed and sound and light, violence we naught may wreck of, and yet there falls from thence the vast unbroken silence, mysterious and intense, that makes the peace, the calmness and the beauty of the night. O spheres of flame and golden, always more far and high, abyss to abyss still floating, onward from shade to shade, so far, so high, all reckoning the wisdom of man has made, before those giddy numbers must shrink in his hands and die. Shining in dim transparency, the whole of infinity lies behind the veils that the finger of radiant winter weaves, and down on us falls the foliage of stars in glittering sheaves from out the depths of the forest, the forest obscure of the skies. End of part 14 Life To see beauty in all is to lift our own soul up to loftier heights than do those who aspire through culpable suffering, vanquished desire. Harsh reality, dread and ineffable whole, distills her red draught enough tonic and stern to intoxicate heads and to make the heart burn. O clean and pure grain, whence are purged all the tears, clear torch chosen out amid many whose flame, though ancient in splendour, is false to its name. It is good to keep step, though beset with hard cares, with the life that is real to the far distant goal with no arm save the lucid white pride of one's soul. To march, thus intrepid in confidence, straight on the obstacle, holding the stubborn hope still of conquering, 
thanks to firm blows of the will, of intelligence prompt or of patience to wait, and to feel growing stronger within us the sense, day by day, of a power superb and intense. To love ourselves keenly, those others within who share a like strife with us, soar without fear toward that one future whose footsteps we hear. To love them, heart, brain, and because we are kin, because in some dark, maddened day they have known one anguish, one mourning, one stress with our own. To be drunk with the great human battle of wills, pale, fleeting reflex of the monstrous assaults, golden movements of planets in heaven's high vaults, till one lives in all that which acts, struggles and thrills, and avidly opens one's heart to the law that rules dread and stern the whole universe o'er. End of part 15 Joy O oh, splendid spacious days, irradiate with flaming dawns, when earth shows yet more fair her ardent beauty, proud without alloy, and wakening life breathes out her perfume rare, so potently that, all intoxicate, our ravished being rushes upon joy. Be thanked, mine eyes, that now ye still shine clear beneath my furrowed brow, to see afar the light vibrating there. And you, my hands, that in the sun yet thrill, and you, my fingers, that glow golden still among the golden fruit upon the wall, where hollyhocks stand tall. Be thanked, my body, that thyself dost bear, yet firm and swift and quivering to the touch of the quick breezes or of winds profound. And you, straight frame and lungs out breathing wide along the shore or on the mountain side the sharp and radiant air that bathes and grips the mighty worlds around o oh, festal mornings calm in loveliness rose whose pure face the dewdrops all caress birds flying toward us like some presage white gardens of sombre shade or frailest light what time the ample summer warms the glade, I love you, Rhodes, by which came hither late, she who held hidden in her hands my fate. I love you, distant marshes, woods austere, and to its depths I love the earth, where here beneath my feet my dead to rest are laid. So I exist in all that doth surround and penetrate me, all this grassy ground, these hidden paths and many a copse of beech, clear water that no clouding shadows reach, you have become to me myself because you are my memory. In you my life prolonged for ever seems, I shape, I am all that hath filled my dreams. In that horizon vast that dazzles me, trees shimmering with gold, my pride are ye, and like the knots upon your trunk, my will strengthens my power to sane, staunch labour still. Rose of the pearl-hued gardens, when you kiss my brow, a touch of living flame it is. To me all seems one thrill of ardour, beauty, wild caress. And I, in this world drunkenness, so multiply myself in all that gleams on dazzled eyes, that my heart, fainting, vents itself in cries. O oh, leaps of fervour, strong, profound and sweet, as though some great wing swept thee off thy feet, if thou hast felt them upward bearing thee toward infinity, complain not, man, even in the evil day. Whate'er disaster takes thee for her prey, thou to thyself shalt say that once, for one short instant, all supreme, which time may not destroy, thou yet hast tasted with quick-beating heart, sweet, formidable joy, and that thy soul, beguiling thee to see, as in a dream, hath fused thy very being's inmost part, with the unanimous great founts of power, and that's that day supreme, 
that single hour hath made a god of thee. End of part sixteen. End of poems by Emil Faharan. Translated by Alma Strettle.